Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Before we dive into today's issue, I want to remind everybody that we now have a Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon. You can get to that at the links below this video. It will give you early access to our videos, get you out in front of the Cartoonist Kayfabe effect. Uh, some of these books go up in value quickly, so if you've got those videos a week before everybody else, give you a chance to track those down at your local comic shop or online, wherever you buy comics. There's even people watching us uh, stream this like in real time. Uh, and these books that we're talking about right now, there might be a couple of them on eBay for sure, but you ain't getting them at the cheapest price. The people in the chat room are able to jump on eBay and Amazon and, and get them before anybody. Absolutely. Uh, we are also working cartoonists. want to remind everybody the best way to support Cartoonist Kayfabe is to buy our books. Ed Piscor's Red Room, X-Men Grand Design, Hip Hop Family Tree, and WYSIWYG are available now. Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive, Plain Janes, Hulk Grand Design are my books that are out now, so pick those up if you haven't already added them to your collection, and we appreciate that. So, today we are going to look at Darwin Cook's issue of Solo. Solo, one of the coolest comics as a series that DC ever published. Fantastic. Basically, shouts, shouts to Mark Chiarello. Man. Yes, the Being editor and the, and the visionary behind this, but these books, for anybody unfamiliar with this series, it's been a few years since this was out now, Ed. I yeah. think of this as a new book, but I, I mean, know, it's right? 15 years old or more. But these would take a creator, in this case, Darwin Cook. The entire issue is his work. So it's kind of like a one-man anthology. I was thinking about this reading it this week, almost like an eight ball for a Dan Klaus or something where he gets to do a variety of stories in different styles, different formats, different characters. Some are original, some are DC. It's a great idea, and it's a bummer that it doesn't uh, didn't continue on, but I also bet it is an editorial headache. And I bet you a lot of the creators, a lot of the, the artists out of Marvel DC aren't necessarily equipped to do an issue like this. It's a, it's a select talent that can write, draw, color, letter, do everything themselves. Not everybody has that skill set. It, it's true. And they gave it to and they gave it to the right guys. They sure did. Uh, but there will be people like like um like you know, Damian Scott got got a solo, not known as a, like a letterer or anything like that. And you get like he's a heck of a drawer some sketchbook type pages, man, where he's just drawing really cool yes. Superman drawings with yeah. and coloring them with markers. It's one of those series that I hope as cartoonist kayfabe goes on, we cover the whole thing. It'll be Absolutely. a playlist with all of them because yeah. they're all super interesting. And especially for a book that has a DC logo on it. What a cool project. Totally. And once again, Mark Chirillo is often you see his name is attached to like all the most interesting stuff, like Wednesday comics and yes. interesting try and interesting play, uh, the spearhead of Batman black and white. And there are now all these like, uh, off, offshoot, you know, Superman red and blue. And, and, uh, the one that, that we here in Pittsburgh take, take personal is I think there was Wonder Woman black and gold with no Pittsburgh oh, yeah, representation. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're right. Like that goes to show Man, you. Man, that should have been a whole kayfabe issue. That, like, like, that goes to show you how, how completely, uh, uh, off the rails DC is with Mark Chirillo not being there. Yeah. Those are some great titles though, man. What a uh, portfolio he has under his editorial belt. But uh, let's dive into this one. Part of the reason I wanted to check this out is Slam Bradley. Yes. Um, I'm working on something that's kind of, uh, I thought I might draw some inspiration from this. So that was what made me pull this book out the other week. But as I start diving into it, it just is like, this is a fun comic. Yeah. And you go to it. So like, what, what, is, what is Slam Bradley? Like Slam Bradley is the the comic strip that Siegel and Schuster are trying to get out into the syndicates before Superman even. Uh, they did explore this character in like the pages of like detective comics or maybe like the latter part of, of issues of action comics mm -hmm. or something. Just kind of. A very by the numbers. Um, in their case, I think just there there was no CIA first off back back in the day. Uh, it, just like you know, Private Dick kind of kind of guy. Yeah, I was thinking like Untouchables. You know, from from an era of uh, I don't know Bonnie and Clyde's and, and and Dillingers and people of that sort. Slam Bradley would be your uh, your tough guy that's fighting that that crime at that level. So um, right off the bat, like this is a one pager, very bizarre style, which is what attracts me to solo is you get to see these guys kind of stretching and doing some different stuff. But this reminds me a lot of an animated style, even of a Kyle Baker, where sure, like some of your drawn lines are being colored. The plastic man. Uh, kind of early in, uh, you know, applying some of these digital tools. But uh, just a one pager to set this up. This is slam, maybe fantasizing about a little adventure here and being knocked out and then snapping back to reality, which this is kind of cuts in between the stories of uh, Slam Bradley going to a bar, hanging out with a few different characters. Kind of an interesting framing device that's not common in all the solos. This is a Darwin Cook uh, choice. Yes, and it, it's not apparent when you're reading it to, either. So, so like, you read this, and then you see another 
comic with like a different title. So it's like, did I read that wrong? Does it feel like it's going any, like it didn't go anywhere. And then you read this, which I think is a uh, auto bio. Yeah. I, 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 I feel like it might be. I, I try to piece together some of these cause there's a really weird story later on in this book that I don't know where it comes from, yeah. but this one does feel auto bio. Even the characters are referred to as, as cook, you know, their last name. So right. this is, I, I believe a young Darwin cook and uh, his dad's taking him to stop in and do some business with his dad, I suppose. Yeah, it's like it's like uh, if it is autobio, it's the story of of Dar- Darwin, you know, getting his first inspirations to draw. Yes, or in this case, paint. Yeah, exactly. So they go to visit a friend of his father's who gives him a golf club to go play with in the backyard. But what's he stumble onto is the man's wife, who is a painter. And this is like where you bring up eight ball. This is the perfect stuff to talk about because uh, Darwin Cook has no venue to do this kind of comic anywhere else. And I think that this is the this is around the time where um, stuff like uh, Blankets is out mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. So it's like his version of, you know, an indie comic uh, at, at the time, you know, playing with different lettering on each strip, which is fucking fascinating. But, you know, this muted color palette, he has access to every coloring, every crayon in the box, but is choosing to do this, which I think is cool. It's a very, this marker restraint is, is awesome uh, to just, you know, tell this kind of story. But it's like a tongue in cheek, aughts version of like what was happening in the indie comics at the time. And he was, he, you know, doing it in a DC, saying, you know, getting a page rate. Yes. To fucking do an indie comic. Yeah. Pretty great too. Like she's oil painting and uh, he recognizes her painting as a painting that's like one at their house. That was from her. That was a wedding present she, she painted for uh, his parents. So kind of cool. Sends him home with some paints and brushes and we end with him staring at a blank canvas you know, pursuing this art direction that his life would uh, would take. It's true, and and then the title is like "World's Window" or something. So the implication, is like pa- paper, is the window to the world, or like you know everything else is going on out there, but like this is the artist's window. Worth noting, the biography of Darwin Cook very unique in comics because he does 15 years as a graphic designer, which makes him really well suited to doing this. You know, having your your lettering and everything color part of it. Then he works for storyboard artist on like the Bruce Tim Batman stuff. Um, had a couple brushes with comics, but really has this rich experience as a visual artist in some other fields that he then eventually brings to comics when he shows up. And I think you see that payoff throughout this issue. Yeah, his compositional acumen is out of control. And then just the stuff that he brings in, like this is this is clear like fifties magazine illustration vibes with like you know going outside the lines and. All of that, and it's and and like little designy t- touches like that. Like this guy's bringing way more than just comic book fanboyism. Yeah, it's interesting to see like the coloring on this one because it's also experimenting with digital. It is, you know, like yeah. he's he's clearly doing this coloring with digital, and I think that works really well sometimes better than other times. Like sometimes the lettering, because he's doing these translucent like backgrounds, um, doesn't always work well. Like here, it's a little bit hard to read, but. Again, it's a guy who's extremely creative, really experimenting in different directions. And I keep thinking, like, he's going to go on to Parker shortly yeah. after this. So you'll see these little hints and flourishes, which remind me of what we're going to see him really kind of develop uh, over the next couple of years in his work. But this is a story about two spies. They're posing as husband and wife on a honeymoon in Cuba and uh, trying to get some information from, a, from an enemy of the state. Yes. And everything goes different than uh, than expected yeah. twist after twist in this one and by the way guys like we talked about that muted color palette on the previous this is a fucking dc comic it could be page after page of omac superman batman all this stuff clearly this is the kind of comic this dude wants to draw but he's get he's getting the page rate to do the comic that he wants okay so i have to plug in slam bradley instead of parker or just like my own guy or the spirit or something like that Uh, But he's making the comic that he wants, and that's the cool thing about these solos. Man, he goes stylistically so, so different, different ranges. Showing off, man. Like, just, just showing, like, just showing his range and what he can do. And it's the compositions, man, that, that just blow your mind continuously. Like, on the very next page, when these dudes get mowed down, uh, look at, look at how, you know, that butta, butta, butta shit, like, 
how he chose to do that. It could have been gratuitous, could have been gross. And then look at that, man. Just ticks with the pen. Just marks with the pen. And you know what that is. Look at that continuity of, like, guys holding his rosary, dropping the rosary, and our last shot is the rosary is just laying on those rocks, you know? And uh, that's going to you play into the story. Thank Christ. Yeah, I, I commend everybody involved with, with doing this. Look, you know, you talk about the mark making and doing some experimentation. Look at how he's like just hatching out shapes. You know, it's silhouette and shapes, but also with some marks that we don't see anywhere else. That's true. And I love this this line. It's just like a, I don't know, it's kind of a dumb line. You know, it's even weight throughout, but it's just, I love it. You Dude, never see this line in, in DC at this time. My my head is in that place right now, man. Like I I've been I've been inking with um you know just like one solid like like a fine liner because I'm watching uh this is a North Star anime and it's like you look looking at this thing and and there was like ink and paint department back then like uh it's just that one line you don't need thick and thins and you just got to like choose the right ones you got to. If you're going to do that, you got to use the right lines. And he, he finds them every time. So we end with uh, the Femme Fatales. They're dispatching both the spy and the enemy and uh, making up their own union. Of course. And I think that Femme Fatale speaks to one of Dar Darwin Cook's uh, interests. You know, that, that 50s kind of it's a uh, trope. dangerous dame. You see it in a lot of his work. Yeah, it's a trope. But check this out. It's two different profiles and it's two different women. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of different materials, you know, this profile cut up by a silhouette that happens to be behind that face. Don't you see, though, if you were to combine these two, you almost get Parker. Oh, absolutely. These two styles. Yeah, you, know, you, can, you can really see him working through some of this. So this is a wild two-page spread. I was reading this by my um, not-great-reading-light at night. Yeah. <laughs> and cursing my damned old eyes <laughs> because there's some very fine detail throughout here. Um, made me think though, this was where I thought of that. This is eight ball. This is, uh, yeah, acne novelty. Chris Ware. yeah, you know, really packing in like different ideas on a page like this. What a, what a two page spread for a DC comic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Chris Ware uh, in the like Chicago reader. And there was this one free kind of newspaper that wasn't like a weekly that they put out in Chicago. I got a couple issues cause Jay Lynch's wife edited it, but Chris Ware would have this kind of space it put like a little strip that goes around the whole thing and then like a little mm -hmm. paper doll and all kinds of stuff. This is great. The history of comics and how it basically like we're, we, we kind of still are here where it's like these manga things called comic books. There used to be these manga things called comic books, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty fun as a comics fan. That, that It's a great strip. And I think it speaks to uh, Cook's love of comics as well. You get your pin up in here, right? He had done the Catwoman um, Selena's Big Score yeah. graphic novel, which is so good. It's such a good comic. Whenever they did, it came out before the Catwoman movie, and I remember thinking like, that was a colossal failure as a as a movie. Why didn't they just adapt Selena's Big Score? Yeah, you know, it's like this pulp novel. It's so good, it would have translated perfectly to screen, and instead, I don't even know what they did. But the style of illustration is like those. There, there would be like maybe three to a page in um playboy like it would mm -hmm. be small spot illustration joints but it would be no holding lines and stuff uh to go along with whatever's on the center spread like there would be quotes or something like that and it would be this like chick that's just in different poses and so it's kind of like that style but they would also do like the airbrush big art also it's like five different playboy style of illustration in in like on this page mm -hmm. It was a great redesign, this, the Catwoman redesign that he did. Yeah, we had Brew Baker on the uh, on the ch on the channel, and he was like, "I know nothing about female fashion, but my wife said there was this thing called a cat suit." And I'm like, "How could Catwoman not wear a That's fucking true. cat suit?" <laughs> Sometimes we overthink it, right? Or do you see the ignorance? Like, yeah, I don't know that what a too. cat suit is. This was the strip that surprised me, and I can't tell you what it is, but it feels like Chris wears Jimmy Corrigan was was the best thing I could connect it to. Not exactly, but I mean, like a panel like that, yeah. very uh, Jimmy Corrigan like. I don't know, man. This one's bizarre. I for didn't me. read it. I, I got bored with it. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't but, know. But this he's rich stretching. guy that, that's fighting a vacuum cleaner. He's stretching. You know, he's doing some things, man. He's he's trying some things out, and guess what? Maybe they all don't land. But I, I was thinking sugar and spike. Yeah, maybe is, is something. Something that... tells me we are going to hear from everybody who thinks that that's the greatest strip ever. So. 
Hey, more power to him, man. Join the comments. Put it in the comments, exactly. And again, going back to our interstitial at Jimmy's 24-7 bar, we're having some drinks, having some conversation, and telling stories. And here comes the question. I really like the aesthetics of this. That's a cool-looking question to me. Reminds me a little bit of the New Frontier stuff. That's it, yeah, yeah. Um, but I like that aesthetic a lot. Limited palette, too. Like, the blue, white, black really works for me. This is like a weird, uh, this is a post 9-11 kind of comic. Right? Don't, don't sleep on it. He is using real duo tone. Uh, the, the way that I got introduced to him, I didn't, because I was way off of DC and Marvel when New Frontier and all that shit came out. It was John B. Cook's Comic Artist Magazine uh, did a piece on Darwin Cook and, and uh, did an interview with him. And it shows some of his duo tone pieces and shit. Like, he, that's what put him on the radar to me. And I just couldn't believe that, like, this new dude is fucking out. I actually, who, who's deciding, like, nah, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to be in a union. Well, he might have stayed in a union for, like, storyboarding and all that stuff. And have that kind of gig when you're fi financially set up forever uh, to, like, do comics. At a time when they were at such a low level in terms of, circulation pay all that shit so the dude is using duotone that's good i would have never uh i wouldn't i wouldn't have thought that just yep. based on how much digital stuff is in here and again i don't know that this does anything except speak to cook's i don't know willingness to try yeah. new stuff to play with new media to play with new software and uh, i think that's kind of cool but i really like this question and i really like how i don't want to say dashed out but these are quick looking drawings to me and I think they work great. They speak to the composition that, that we pointed out a few times in this issue. Yeah, look at that, man. Because to be able to work at this kind of simplified style and read, that's composition. It is. And, and it's like the, it, on this one, he's employing a very thick brush, very thick brush, almost no holding lines. All the, all the lines you see are shadow. And that's different. You know, he was using pens and stuff before. I was going to say, like, what a contrast from, like, this line art yeah. to these kinds of big, heavy blacks. He's using this platform of this solo to its greatest, you know, potential. Probably probably better than all the rest of the guys. We're going to have to look at those issues and find out. Yeah. So, once again, we cut back to Jimmy's, and guess who's finally shown up? Slam's uh, friend, Selena. Which brings us to a Batman story. In that eight-panel grid that we would see in stuff like Stray Bullets, um, I think this was even Bruce Tim used the eight-panel grid like this in his Black Man Black and White oh, yeah. story. So very much like storyboarding, which, you know, if you're going to do a project like this, do lean into your strengths. Do show off a little bit. And uh, Cook has experienced storyboarding that exceeds most comic book artists, even the ones who dabble in storyboards. I mean, he made his living doing that. So... Let's see it, man. Let's see what you got. The des his design for Batman is fantastic. I think I think they they went that direction with these animated series and stuff, like having the weird horns like that. I, I just don't keep up with that, all of that kind of stuff. But they're keeping those those palettes from the show, the black and the reds, you know, the dark crimsons. And this is like the one like full color. Like this is the closest to what, you know, the people who said that, that Kevin Nolan issue of uh, New Mutants is the worst ever. This is the closest to like what a comic book is to like those nitwits. <laughs> it's funny because in a lot of ways, what comic looks like this? Right. But it's like a color and yeah, it's yeah. got the panels that we understand. Yeah. Batman, uh, he's in hot pursuit of some robbers who, whenever they run out before they hop in their car, they kill some little kid's parents. So very reminiscent of the uh, something Batman can relate, right? Man, and he leaves that little kid on the sidewalk with his dead parents and goes after these guys, not going to let them get away. And it becomes almost a horror story where one guy's freaking out because he, he sees a shadow of Batman on the roof as the car passes by and uh, realizes Batman is up there, slams on the brake, shoots through the roof. He's not there. Where is he? Now we've got him in front of the full moon zine, full moon. <laughs> <laughs> Werewolf Batman. They unload their guns there, but come on. We all know that that's Amazing not Amazing pacing. I like keeping keep Batman mysterious, uh, choosing all the right shots and angles. Uh, it, it is a good thing to know that he was a storyboard artist because if he was just coming cold into comics with this kind of um, eyes, you know, this ability to set a scene, that would be too exceptional. And where it speaks 
really loud to me is like we have this move where Batman has right. drawn everybody away from the car and then disappears as they're looking for his body. And guess what? He's ducked back to their car and taken the keys. Amazing. Like he's really just messing with them. Right. He's the devil. They call him. And imagine, I mean, this, this, he is the boogeyman. And the great shots whenever the cars are taken off, like some of those shots to me speak of storyboard mastery. And look at it. Like, obviously it's a pretty well drawn kind of idea of a car. But it's a simple drawing. Completely you know, stylized. Yeah, yep. it's it's uh, it's not a lot of lines. It's a lot of black areas and areas that he's choosing to keep open. And, I mean, geez. We talk about directional devices. Here's a great example. Yeah. Right into the next panel. And even that panel continues those kinds of directional devices. That's one of those things that I feel like uh, one of the guys that brought that stuff into comics in a big way is Joe Kubert. Like, if you look at old Joe Kubert, he would do that kind of thing. Where it would, it would, uh, you would have to... Pay attention a little bit to it, but when you see it, the way he would connect the whole page with uh, compositional things like that, just Bernie Krigstein might be the other guy who could do it at that level. So we talked about limited color palette, but we're at a new setting now, right? So yeah. let's change our color palette. Even though it's still limited, we go from the road outside at night in these purples to suddenly we're in a cabin, and now we've got brown and reds. Not a big change. That palette's still very limited, but it's clear we're in a different location now. Yep. And continuing our horror movie theme, right? Stark shows up, which once again, Richard Stark, the author of the uh, Parker novels, you could see where uh, I, I have a feeling Cook must have been thinking already about how that was going to work. Just his influences. You know, he likes that kind of stuff. The dude wore a goddamn fedora. He ain't playing. Like, you know he, what? He, he likes that kind of shit. You're, you're, yeah, you're so right about that because the bar where they're going to uh, Jimmy's 24-7 on a corner of Nexus and Continuity. <laughs> so yeah he's throwing out some uh yeah definitely some easter eggs for all of us and drives this guy out into the woods basically drives him crazy as he's chasing after him the devil as you uh as you call it ed he called it you're right definitely the manifestation of that he even looks like hell piece. with that red background that's like almost full um parker there would be like like the uh what was it? The man with, uh, the, with the, the getaway face. The, the getaway face. Like the, that's even the palette almost. Yeah, but man, whenever you talk about devil and hell, look at that background that he's coming out of. Oh, like one hundred percent, that's what he's walking out of. He got to assume he notified the cops, and now he's just watching from a distance as these guys are going to be uh, paying their price. And when he goes home, man, remembering his own parents, dropping tear. That's a tough. <laughs> that was a tough night on the job for Batman. Hey, look at this. Yeah. The seats float. Uh, that's fun. <laughs> Futuristic bar in a comic book. Why not? They have one more drink, and uh, Selena invites him back, and he says, no thanks. Yeah, is that, is that the whole point? Like, Because cause, uh, those pieces it were just no, no big deal to me. No, they're just, uh, they're just bookends, you know, kind of walking you through. Yeah. A little bio in here. Such an interesting story. You know, like, he really comes into comics in his mid-30s, like, having worked a career. Makes him pretty unusual compared to your average comic book artist. But he's had a couple of run-ins. Like, we did a um, New Talent Showcase, DC's early 80s book, where, you know, new, new cartoonists would kind of break in. He has one of those. Yeah. And then he, the follow-up, I think, gets lost. I think he sends uh, some editor, asks for, for a pitch, which I think is what becomes it's in there. Batman Ego. And uh, that one again, ends up misplaced for a couple of years. I think a lot of, like 10 years. Yeah. And I think it's Mark Chiarello who's like, yeah. what the fuck? This has dust on it? Are you kidding me? Yeah. And it's it's just interesting to think about like who he is as a cartoonist because of that unusual path to get there. You know what the lesson is with that, man? You got to go like um, Jeff Matsuda. And when you send your, your samples, it's got to be in a hot pink ev envelope. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> also follow up. Yeah, maybe. F huh? Follow up a lot. But uh, one of the interesting cartoonists that have come come out of the mainstream, I think, in uh, in, in history of American comics, and uh, rest in peace, Darwin Cook, you know, no longer with us, died way too young. Absolutely. But left behind a, a heck of a body of work. Met him a couple of times, man, uh, in Toronto, and uh, it was sort of on the same general occasion. Uh, me and Tom were, were at, at the Beguiling when we very first met him. And had just an amazing conversation with the dude. He was so nice. He and I were both up for 
lettering uh, Eisner's and wow. stuff. And he was so sweet. And he was like, oh, man, you're going to kick my ass. I'm like, shut the fuck up, dude. There's no way. Because, I mean, it's Parker. That uh, It's like, no. I, you're very nice. You're very kind. Thank you, Darwin. But uh, one of the things that uh, he he sort of left us with, like, in that conversation, man, was um, he was basically like, listen, with these editors. Because I think I started with uh, X-Men Grand Design. He knew the deal. I think. And he was like, you know, just make the best comics you can. Let these motherfucking editors know that uh, it could be done fast, it could be done on time, or it can be good. And and uh, just, you know, get them on board. And I thought that was a super cool thing. And also, uh, that weekend, we had we were on a panel. It was like the worst fucking panel I pro maybe was ever on, ever, because of technical issues and people were trying to, like, we started way late because the people before us went went too much, and the it was it was it was bad. But it was with Darwin Cook, Katie Skelly, Tom Spurge was the moderator, and Mimi Pond. And um, it's amazing that's a bad panel. You just lay out the people that are involved. It's like they wouldn't let us do great. anything. Like they they we had to, you know, they had to let some fucking schmucks do whatever they did for like. An hour and a half and then like the real pros like get have to make the time e even out uh but so nobody could do anything talk anything Spurgeon tried to push and it was weird but he it's such a cool move or whatever like he read everybody's book Donald Cook read everybody's book before the panel and so many almost everybody's in business for themselves at these things that they're just like up there with whoever but he clearly read everybody's book and like had questions about everybody's book. And that's just, that speaks to the man, you know? Yeah. That's a nice story. Yeah. Well, that's all I got for this one, but uh, fun to go through. And like I said, not the last solo that we'll look at, probably not the last Darwin cook either, because Selena's big score is one of my favorites, especially as a crime book. So uh, we'll, we'll look at more of his work too, as uh, time goes on. Yes, sir. Recipes, Darwin cook. And uh, listen, there's probably a half dozen to uh, 50 of these, uh, Darwin Cook solos on eBay, but the people who are getting them first are the people watching us on the live stream uh, or who have seen the video before anybody else on uh, our Patreon. We have a link in the description below. Join us at that King Kayfabe level. You get all the videos before anybody else. Completely uh, mitigates that Kayfabe effect. But Jimmy, let the people know what books you got out there. Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Live, and Plain Janes are both out right now. Hulk Grand Design out February 22nd. Pre-order that. Reserve that one at your local shop if you haven't already because there will be limited number of those. And Street Angel, Princess of Poverty. Pre-order it now from Image Comics out later this year. Uh, you can also join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg where you can see lots more of my comics and art and what I'm working on. And you can download out of print zines and mini comics there. Red Room is the focus right now for uh, for myself. I have two trade paperbacks out there, Red Room the Antisocial Network and Red Room Trigger Warnings. It's the 10th anniversary of Hip Hop Family Tree, so if you see those books out there, man, support the project that way. I'd appreciate that in a big way. I'm serializing new Red Room comics on my own Patreon. Three bucks get you the archive over there. have all the earliest comics, uh, plus I put new strips out every Tuesday. Links in the description below this video to get to all those destinations. Jimmy, what else do we have out there? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also under the video. Another great way to support the channel, man. Give them those marching orders, Jim. We'll be on our way. Read more comics.